You can start then. an opportunity to save the world. It is time that we recognize the woman naturally empowered to lead and guide and develop well-being practices. In normal life, we don't have time to think about it, but as a family, we should be looking at it. And the principles are very important. Politics without principles, business without morality, power without humility, wealth without work. These are the issues that has made everyone very difficult now. So these principles are important. Now you, you look at the beauty of our world is the diversity of people. That is what is endowed humanity with such power. If you look at the kind of problems we have, sustainability problems with 7.5 billion people, pollution and all these things. So the most important thing for us is that human beings okay. must be sustainable. If human beings are not sustainable, there can be no sustainable development in our world. If you look at climate change, the major problems we have in climate change are the same events, food security, extinction of species, air and water, and the current migration. And while climate change is happening, the viruses, the pests, and the diseases are all mutating. And the corona is one of those first ones beyond the other ones that came. And so the future looks very difficult. So while women can be the spirit and the drivers of sustainable development with empathy, mindfulness, patient, caring, conscious, compassionate. And these are the things that they need to teach the children and the men in this confinement. You know, there are 1.5 billion children at home in lockdown positions. So the women and youth have to provide the leadership. They have the political power. They have the power of business with money. So this is important. And the most amazing thing is that even in COVID pandemic, the task forces in the United States, only 10% of the task force members are women. In Italy, it's 23%. In the United Kingdom, it is 30%. So the school of life must begin at home. In school, they learn all kinds of science subjects and maths and everything else, which carries on in institution. But the knowledge about the world of nature, world of humans, the ethics, the morals, the conscience, the character, these are the things that parents can devote their time and teach the children. And there is no better time than in lockdown to have the time to have a dialogue with the children. It's not a matter of a teacher teaching. It's a dialogue. It's a family dialogue with love and compassion. And that is the beginning of this school of life education, which will complement what they learn in normal schools and normal institution. Also, during the time in lockdown, it's time to think. It's time to talk. It's time to realize. And it's time to think of what are the actions that we can experience here in lockdown and then carry them forward. So even simple questions with the children, with, with the partner, who am I? What is my purpose? What is happening? What can I do? And we know modern lifestyles driven by materialism, greed, and power are the cause of so many problems in the world. We have borrowed this world from our children. We must empower as parents and educators to prepare our children for tomorrow's world as leaders. So empowering women is empowering generations to come. And the women have these attributes with which 
they can bring this to the family. And also in partnership with men, it has to be a partnership of equals. And during lockdown is the time for dialogue even between, between the two partners to see how we can come together, how we can help each other in the interest of making our family happy, our children more progressive, our, our friends more progressive, our family more progressive, and the people out there. And most important, how can we begin caring for the nature? So I will stop there and I'll hand it over to you, Dipa. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and welcome everyone. I'm just gonna jump right in uh, because we've got some amazing panelists and uh, we're gonna get their views. Um, they're a spectrum of tech, um, social development, yoga, practitioners, thought leaders and conscious teachings, engineers. So we're gonna dive straight in and I'm gonna go to Anna. Um, Anna is a yoga practitioner and she's a leader in conscious teaching. She's um, based in Denmark, which, as we know, is led by a woman, a strong woman, who's brought the country through the COVID crisis quickly and efficiently and emotionally showing herself. Um, but one of the first questions I want to pose to Anna is, how might we encourage women in the current circumstances of COVID-19 um, to really come to the front, given their limited resources of being at home and in lockdown. Anna, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for that introduction. So, as you mentioned, yeah, I'm speaking from a perspective of being a yoga teacher, but also coming from a school uh, of young entrepreneurs and project leaders where uh, the students actually have influence on um, how the future of the school is going to look like. And the reason why I think this, how might we encourage women and make them realize their power and potential is because that's a journey I've been on um, personally myself throughout these years of realizing uh, that I can actually go out and, and do things on my own. Uh, usually we're, we're of a, a quite traditional understanding of, of men, the men being the leaders and the men being in power. But from my experience as a yoga teacher and from my experience of going to the school where I have more influence, I realized that, that both women and men have the power within to do whatever they desire. And that's something, how that specifically could look like would be us women encouraging each other to go out and, and do whatever we, we dream of. So whatever dreams and passions we have, I encourage people during our circumstances where we can't meet physically and join women's circles and all of this and join yoga classes, we can still encourage each other through media. So for an example, through our social media platforms, if we go out and we have a dream of um, studying some sort of project or, or beginning a, a personal journey, we need to start sharing these moments with each other through pictures and through, through comments. And, and it can, can easily be done. And I think it's, it's very important, especially through uh, young women, because the young women especially are, are looking at social media and they're so insecure about themselves because they're comparing um, themselves with with other people and we need to start sharing and being more um more open towards uh being being taking action on the ideas and the dreams and desires we have okay great um and then linked to that i suppose as well is a a kind of show of vulnerability um and I mean, how might a trend of showing vulnerability emerge during this pandemic crisis moment? Yeah, so that's the reason why that's an interesting uh, question for me to pose myself and has been uh, the latest times is because I see that there's so much perfectionism going on uh, on social media and uh, in life in general. We only share the, the good things. And a, a part of being a woman is also a part of being very sensitive and very vulnerable. So we have that nature within us. And 
once we actually start sharing that with our spouses or our boyfriend or our, our uh, friends and, and relationships in general, these relations become so much stronger because it's only through the, the, the really vulnerable times and our shortcomings and our insecurities that we can really share and connect with people. And this is uh, us as women being uh, the vulnerable beings that we are and the sensitive and caring beings that we are it comes much more natural to us. So again, it's through uh, how I see that we can do it during our circumstances right now at this moment, go out and do that tomorrow. We need to start sharing from a, a more vulnerable perspective. Also be, being op open and honest about having a bad day. And it, could, it can again be put in, into media saying, you know what, I, I had this day, it was, it was uh, not the nicest. I dealt with these emotions so they are, they're, um, they're coming every now and again. But then when you show your own vulnerability, uh, fortunately how things work is that it's uh, admirable and uh, it's also um, something that can make other people uh, start sharing their vulnerability as well. Great, thank you Anna. I think that's a perfect moment. If you don't mind to bring Krasi in, Krasi Mira, she's... Um, uh, a beautiful lady that spent 20 years working in the exceptionally male-dominated world of tech. Um, and, you know, we have some quite a few. I can't see everyone on the screen, but I know for sure that men have joined this conversation. So this, this you know, this conversation must be had between and amongst um, and with the backing of both male and female. But one of the questions I have for Krasi, having spent 20 years in this tech industry, is, you know, Anna is talking about vulnerability and the characteristics and traits um, of a woman. But in terms of how these attributes are, va are valued in the male-dominated corporate world that you work in, you know, how does it fit in? How do we make those attributes more valuable and not seen as reactive or emotional or, you know, going off piece with, with emotion? Can you share some of that, your insight on yeah. that? Sure. Thanks so much, Deepa. And hi, everyone from sunny Germany today. Um, so it, it's a good point that you're bringing, uh, Deepa. And I have to tell you that when I started working in the high tech industry, um, what I actually saw is that, which is male dominated, like you said, 70, more than 70% of the people who are employed in the Google of the world or all the software companies and Facebook that develop like these great things that we use on a daily basis as individuals, but also in enterprises, um, said more than 70% of the folks are, are male, right? So it's, it's a very male dominated world. And so is the banking industry, right? That we know very well. Um, and what I saw happening is that women were very much suppressing uh, these values that you spoke about and also vulnerability. They want to portray themselves as, as perfect, right? Which puts so much pressure on them and on that way to portray themselves as being like super, um, uh, super strong and savvy um, and emulating this male-like behaviors, even like the ways they, they dress up or the way they, they carry their, their hairstyles. Um, this, uh, this was a very sad moment, right? This was very sad along the way how I saw a lot of women suppressing these behaviors. Um, so, but here's the thing, what I see now, and, and I don't want to call it a revolution, I just call it a movement, um, is something that um, over, it's over the past maybe five years, um, that business leaders are slowly starting to take notice and, and giving equal chance of, um, of women to participate into, um, um, into the workforce. Um, and this is through initiatives like equal pay, more women in leadership positions, which is acknowledged at the top of, um, in the business world, if you will. So it comes from uh, the CEO of um, Apple, Tim Cook, who himself is a gay guy. So he knows very well what it means to be gay and what it means to struggle through life. And he came from like, Alabama, where being a gay was almost like sacrilegious, right? So he knows how it feels um, to come from, from a background that um, is, is very difficult to cope with. Um, so he, he started this movement in Apple 
um, to give women um, equal rights, equal pay. Uh, so in my company, um, we have initiatives for every three years, salaries of women are, are or minorities for that matter, are brought equally. Um, we also have initiatives for wellness reimbursement, uh, parental leave, both for men and women. So I, what I'm saying is that we see absolutely uh, acknowledgement at the top of them, uh, some real, really strong business leaders in the high tech industry to acknowledge the values of compassion, um, the values, uh, the values that women bring, um, vulnerability. And what Anna spoke about, vulnerability is absolutely a big thing, right? Um, and it kind of like starts coming out more and more as part of this movement. Um, so this is personally what I see. Also, what I see is that uh, you guys probably saw on the, on the page, on the front page of Times Magazine, I was acknowledged like a lady by the name of Yolanda Fisher, kind of like who no one knows who is Yolanda Fisher, right? Um, and she's one of these unheard heroes um, that was working in a cafe in Dallas and prepared 60,000 meals for um, underprivileged families and children. And, and she was on the front page of Times Magazine. And this kind of acknowledgement um, like raises a lot of awareness among the women. They'll say, hey, I can be powerful and I can be recognized. And this creates a flywheel effect. So I actually see a movement um, coming out. And, um, and also like with the leaders uh, of like Angela Merkel and Jacinda Arden. Uh, so Angela Merkel is, um, like, she's considered a very tough leader, but let me tell you, every time I listen to her speech, especially now when the pandemic started, she speaks with a lot of passion and a lot of empathy to her fellow citizens. And, um, and it, like, you saw what happened uh, over the last few months. So, so Germany is kind of like trying to, is managing it slightly better than, than some other countries. Um, but she, she is, not only she's very down to earth, but she also brought really a lot of empathy, compassion, and vulnerability. And sometimes she makes jokes um, that kind of like shows how vulnerable she is and she doesn't have solutions for everything. And she stands in front of 80 million Germans and just does this. And this kind of like gives a bit of empowerment. Um, and, and you're like, oh, if Angela Merkel does this and she's a chancellor of this big country and she shows vulnerability and she shows empathy and compassion, so this is kind of like you say, oh, this goes a long way, right? So these empowering examples, I think they're starting a movement. So this is kind of like a little bit how I feel about um, what you just asked. Yeah, that's, that's some great insights, Kathy. Um, it's, it's true that, you know, women in power have a big role to play as well as uh, men in power. Um, and if I move uh, now to Kashini, who's on who's online, she, she can speak a bit more about the interplay between men and women in lockdown as well as in uh, social development con uh, context because Kashini has spent her career as a strategy consultant in the development sector and she lives in Mumbai's very strict lockdown. It's still going on. She's working from home, um, touching areas in Africa, India, other developing countries. And uh, more importantly, perhaps most important of all, she's working at home with two children, her son and her daughter. So I wanted to ask um, Kashini, and another bit, I've seen your question, maybe Kashini will answer this, hopefully, uh, because another bit is asking about the role of men and understanding the changed responsibilities in the lockdown situation um, and their importance, the, the men, man's role, you know, are so critical as well in the lockdown to empower the women. So, you know, what's your view, Kashini, on women empowerment and whether this lockdown is indeed an opportunity to make a dramatic shift towards the betterment of women empowerment as opposed to creating another obstacle? Women today in a COVID situation um, make up probably more than 70% actually of the global frontline health force, but, but are significantly underrepresented when it comes to decision making. What this essentially means in a COVID situation, um, and we've seen this, we've seen this in Ebola, we've seen this in many of the other pandemics across the globe, is that any response rat lacks that, that gender lens, right? Which, which is increasingly becoming important. Um, and, uh, you know, what, one thing that I, I struggle with in all of this is when we talk about women as 
caregivers, um, you know, as, as the key neighbors. And, I, and I'm, I'm not disputing that. Women certainly are the primary caregivers, but they're more than the primary caregivers, right? They are actually the enablers of the next generation when it comes to health, nutrition, and education. Um, and, and I've seen this across my work, right? Women, if, if, you, if you, for example, financially include women, women tend to spend more money on health, nutrition, and education um, of their children than, than anything else. So um, in many ways, I would actually argue that, that women are already highly empowered from the home and the, and the empathy and the family and the household perspective, right? Where I see um, a need for empowerment is, is actually at the end of the day, we, we talk about paid and unpaid care work and we talk about sharing of responsibility. Um, actually, one of the reasons we have this debate in, in many ways is because women have unequitable access to uh, economic empowerment, right? And if we trace back economic empowerment and where it comes from, it comes from equitable access to uh, education, uh, dignified, meaningful work, fair wages, fair working conditions, and pathways to leadership, right? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of glossing over it. This, of course, is much more complex than I am making it out to be. But, but in the end, if you want to talk about empowerment, we must, must touch on economic empowerment, right? And today, um, women don't have an equitable access in many parts of the world. They don't have equitable access for many, many different reasons to education, to, to dignified work, um, to, to fair wages, etc. And even in the West, we hear consistently about the glass ceiling and it does exist. Right? Um, and so for me, women's, women's empowerment in isolation is, is absolutely meaningless. Right. So, so one is we need to talk about economics. The other one is men, boys need to be included. Um, in this conversation. We cannot bring about change if we keep talking about women as, um, you know, just just caregivers of, in a household, just mothers, right? Women are capable of, of you know, more, more. And I, and I hate, sorry, I, I apologize to the men on this, uh, on this chat, but at the end of the day, women are capable of more than that. Um, but it has to come back to, to the root causes of, of what ends up being lack of uh, gender equity in many forms of life. Okay, thanks, Kesh. That was, uh, that was exceptionally clear. <laughs> and, uh, and no, whilst, whilst I agree that women, um, it is a challenge um, because we're talking about a lockdown situation so women can empower themselves in the home. But um, on a global scale, of course, a lot still needs to be done uh, on that conversation. This chat is really to explore amongst us um, the women in lockdown. Is it the birth now of the empowerment movement? And Dad, I'll, I'm going to bring you in, Mahendra, onto this question um, from, now my chat box is gone, but how do you create, aware, sorry, Chandan, from Chandan. How do you create awareness regarding sustainability and ecological solutions to the elderly in India? What is the global outlook, especially understanding most of the elderly, 60s to 70s range, who contribute for multiple opportunities and obstacles? Well, I, th I think... Uh... When you look at the elderly who are today 60 or 70, uh, they were born around the, around the Second World War. And they have seen the times, and also that generation has inherited a lot of the, the generation before, which was much more conscious of living in harmony, maybe even because of your poverty. If you look at, for example, in the slum areas all around the world, it's the elderly who are using everything recycled much more efficiently. So bringing this knowledge to them on sustainability and ecological solutions, they have to be done at the ground level. Because these are also remember that the elderly are the ones with whom under normal situations, the children play with the elderly. 
And that's a source of sustainability knowledge also for the very young children. So I think spreading this knowledge, especially in India and the news media, the film industry, etc., needs to invest more into sustainability, ecological, human problems, the problems of the migrants and all these challenges that India is facing. And that is, the media can play a major role in this. Uh, a lot of the people are always every night into a Bollywood movie. And that also needs to move into the area of sustainability and ecological solutions as, as part of the message to change the world. Uh, in Earth Odyssey, we are proposing that the music world should at some point create a dialogue at the global level and create a music event. You know, we've had music events for various things in the past for famines and so on. And it's time to have a music event to empower women and to empower the next generation. Now we are always talking about, we must empower women. I think we also have to ask the question, who is we? Is it more than 80% of the CEOs in this world? Is it more than 80% of all the leaders of the political leaders of the world? Is it 70, 80% of the scientists in the world? So this we is dominated by one gender. And it's time for women to, in this lockdown situation, to understand the power of what nature has endowed them with. And if you talk to the elderly, they very well know what the power they have, the compassion, the silence, the conscious. And these are the attributes we need. You can imagine that if you want to heal somebody by going in softly, softly, you heal that person and you rebound. And the same thing applies to nature, that nature will respond with compassion and love. So I think these are the issues that are very important and women have to self-realize. And in this lockdown, it is happening. I think they need to find time. Uh, Noah did ask the question about men. You know, men and women locked together in this situation need when the children go to sleep, instead of watching a movie on the television, need to talk and between themselves openly discuss this. Because if one third of the world is in lockdown, you have one third of men and women in lockdown in the world. And that's a big 30% step forward to try and put some sense into the parents that we have to change. And I think this moment, this crisis, because there has never been this crisis, and perhaps the strongest word in this crisis is fear. Fear what is outside those four walls in which you are locked down, because we don't know what's going to happen out there. And this is the time to look within ourselves and find out why it's happened and what can we do that this, the risks of this are reduced. Thank you. Did anyone have any other questions? If so, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question or write it in the chat box. But in the meantime, I would also encourage everyone um, to have a look at the link that Diego has posted, um, earthodyssey.org. Um, earthodyssey.org, I don't know if Yuri or Dad uh, Mahendra wants to talk a little bit about Earth Odyssey, because actually Earth Odyssey is the reason we're all here today. It's the start of an incredible initiative to gather the youth the women and the men around the world to take action. Um, and this has been founded by Yuri Sanada, who's on here. I don't know if Yuri wants to talk. If you do, unmute yourself, Yuri, and step forward into the limelight. Um, and please introduce, there, there we go, I can see Yuri. Oh, he disappeared. Um, but Yuri Sanada and Mahendra Shah have founded Earth Odyssey. Yuri, can I ask you to say a couple of words, please? Yeah, sure. Good morning to all. Okay, can you hear me? I think so. Yeah, good morning, all. Yeah, I'm in Brazil. Now it's about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And the idea uh, was born when I was in Bali visiting uh, Mr. Mahendra, and we spoke about you know the, the world is changed. Of course, we have we all have to do a part in, in this, so I have a better future, a better sustainable future. And so 
we, we thought to put together a channel. We put together a tool where people can contribute from all over the world, like send videos, send uh, podcasts, send voice ideas. And we make it available to other, other people who want you know, to work for this change. So that's the basic thing. So we put together this website and put a YouTube channel that's come up in, I think, 27, 28 days when I have the youtube.com-fodyssey uh, for us, this uh, address. And then uh, we intend to continue doing these webinars. We intend to continue uh, asking people to co contribute, to, to send the videos, to send their message so we can spread the word, we can spread uh, practical solutions on how to empower women, also men, I mean, how we can, as educators, contribute to make leaders we need. I mean, I'm from Brazil. I don't know if you guys hear me, but we have a, a very big crisis, not on the pandemics, but also a political crisis because of our lack of leaders. We don't have you know, very good leaders nowadays. And I think it's a worldwide problem. So that's maybe the solution. We have to empower the people who educate the children so that we can teach them not only the price of things, but the value and how they can be better leaders for a future. Otherwise, we won't have a, 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 an earth for, for the next generations, not as we, we wish. So that's all. Uh, please uh, continue uh, with us and share on the website, share on the webinars and the YouTube channel, all the ideas, and let's make this a, a better sustainable world for everybody. Thank you. Can I, can I just add uh, a little bit to what Yuri said? How do we train the youths as well as women participants in the area of leadership. So we are thinking of having panel discussions around the world on subjects, uh, the challenges that humanity is facing uh, in society as well as in the environment and in the economy. So for example, let's take uh, climate change as an example. We will collect information on existing in films and videos on climate change out of which we will create, a, let's say, a 30-minute documentary. And we will have a panel discussion in six countries, because we plan to do it in 60 countries, six subjects in 10 countries each. So climate change movie will be shown to a panel. The panel will comprise of something like 24 people. There'll be gender balance. Half of the people in the, in the panel will be uh, youths again with gender balance. And let's say if we did this in Australia, we would also have minority balance. So there would be 10% Aborigines, for example. So we will try and have this panel discussion. You show the 30 minute climate change uh, documentary, and then the discussion, including two, pol two politicians, two businessmen, two scientists at senior level will be in the audience, in the, in the panel. And each one will have the same amount of time, including the youth, to make a statement which is focused on action. So you can imagine when we have this for six or 10 subjects from 60 countries, this will form the basis of a master documentary, maybe even an IMAX movie, to highlight that the word action, because for 50 years, we only make agenda after agenda after agenda. And that's why even in climate change, climate action is still not happening in spite of the marching by the children and so on. So the panels will be very important. And we plan to have the panels in universities. Why universities? Because the universities were established to serve society. Today, many colleges and universities have become degree producer, vocation producers. And we need to go back and have societal dialogues within universities and that's very important to do so we have this second aim to convince universities that going back to the original foundations that this dialogue would be very useful so that is also part the panel idea is very important and we will have our channels on lifestyle on nature and on empowerment as part of the earth odyssey project yeah that's the idea to summarize the idea is to get more people involved, more people engaged, uh, and provide better material for the next generations to work with. I mean, it's just a matter of getting everybody to collaborate because it's, it's our plan, right? It's the only plan that we have so far. So has, let's take care of it. Okay, thank you. This small group here that has launched 
the Earth Odyssey webinar series covers five continents. So it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just the numbers here. We're talking about the span, the geographical span that we're covering. Um, if anyone, if a future series knows any speakers, any thought leaders, you know, we don't say to, no to anyone. I mean, this is an inclusive project. Anyone wants to get involved, please share. Please share the websites with them, earthodyssey.org um, and the YouTube channel. But we want everyone to be involved in this conversation. Okay, so I'm just going to hand over to you. I can see you want to. So I wanted to, uh, yeah, so I think there's, a, there's two questions um, on the chat, and I just wanted to make sure we cover those off as well. So um, Novidet had raised a question, I think, on, um, I'm just looking at this. But, but basically, how do you ensure that men um, have, you know, un undertake their fair share of labor? Um, uh, interesting, interesting point there. But if I can just respond to that at a high level. So it's hard. It's, it's culturally very hard, particularly in India. Um, but I think, again, in many parts of the world. At, at the end of the day, um, the way... I, I really believe that there's a there's a generational shift coming, right? Um, today, when I look at the videos that, that work with me, I see them, I see the, the young men that are undertaking much more um, of, of the, you know, the share that maybe my husband or, or certainly my my uh, father-in-law, for example, or, or, even, or even my father would have undertaken. Um, I think a, lo a lot of what you're seeing is actually leadership by example at this point in household. Right, the, the younger children to see them trying to do chores, and my, my son trying to be very helpful, um, but that's certainly one way, and that, and that that is going to take time. The other question is my sister, and and Rex, thanks for bringing this up. But you know, uh, she's asked about domestic abuse, and and we've seen those rises in COVID. They're actually exponential in some cases. There's there's many many more instances of GBV coming up. Um, I think here it's the combination of both awareness and we get help to these women. Um, how do we make sure these women are aware of the help that is available? And how do we make sure that they actually have, um, or at least responses to those individual situations? There's never an e easy answer to this, right? Gender-based violence. Anyway, uh, nobody particularly more than happy to connect more on this if, if you want to. Um, I'd love to hear other people's opinions of how do you bring change? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I run a wellness marketplace out of Asia. We're operating in eight countries. We're also partners with Zen. And we see a lot of women uh, solo travelers who are a part of these retreats, which focuses so much on uh, these core aspects. So we definitely uh, do see this. And I think uh, men do have a role to play in terms of how they conduct themselves. How And it's not just India, but across the globe, the problem is the same that men need to understand this, that they have to for the future generations. Now, I would just say to, to Keshe's point, um, this, this lockdown situation and the domestic violence. So this is a huge thing, right? But you know what? A lot of women just kind of like look at this and say, well, I have to accept the situation as is, right? So probably this is how it's supposed to be. And I believe um, a, a lot of women don't acknowledge still the fact that there's a way to change this, right? That they're not supposed to live with this. And probably that they're, they're making Maybe mothers or grandmothers suffered that situation. And awareness and acknowledgement that this can be changed. And probably now is the time to reset this um, and think about that um, there is a way out from this. Thank you, Cressy. Um, Ramon, are you online now? Ramon is calling in from Australia. Hello, yes. Can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. I wanted to bring Ramon in. This is an, a perfect moment because... He was raised in Mexico. He's worked with indigenous communities in Papua New Guinea. Um, and people might not know this, but Mexico is a highly matriarchal society. And I wanted to bring in Ramon into this discussion, comparing maybe, you know, I don't like to compare, but uh, places like Southeast Asia, Asia. Um, so Ramon, please give us a little bit of insight about women empowerment, women in lockdown with your cultural upbringing hat on sure look uh in mexico we have a saying um that men have the last say in the house 
And that is, uh, yes, dear. So that summarizes what the Mexican culture is in reality. You know, there's this uh, view of the Mexican macho culture which has some true, uh, but in reality, the, the house is owned by, by the ladies. Women rule in the house. And uh, today is, is, uh, is more than ever very important because we're spending a lot of time uh, in Mexico and in other parts of the world in the house. Uh, so the, the Mexican women are, are very uh, much in control of the household, you know, and uh, growing up there, my mother, uh, you know, is one of my biggest heroes, raising children in a, in a hard economy as, as Mexico, which is very similar to, to other economies. Um, but there's, uh, there's a lot of aspects about resilience, joy, and unconditional love that came from my mother. And those are the ones that I carry uh, until today. And uh, in observing you know, what happens growing up in Mexico, um, I noticed that particularly for lo lockdown, we have a very interesting cultural trait, which is sobremesa. Sobremesa is basically sitting around the table and uh, just having conversations about life and eating, having a coffee or a tea. And this could last for hours, right? And, and it's a very, very particular cultural aspect in the Mexican tradition. Now, in these times, this becomes really important because this is something that naturally is given uh, to, to the Mexican society. We do this on a regular basis. And now it's happening every day. And it's a perfect opportunity for really women to be in touch with the whole family and uh, do from some inspiration, but also talk about the hard subjects that we have and everything that's happening around their life. So women have this natural power of gathering, of bringing people together. And now they can exert that, um, that ability, that natural gift that they have in the house and by you know, cooking a good meal, but also sitting down at that table and discussing the important subjects. Now, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, aspects that are not probably discussed, but these, these are the topics that will start to become uh, the centerpiece of these sobre mesas that we're having there, that these women can talk to in their families when they're doing these exercises at home. Now, these are the important cultural aspects that already exist that are being driven by, naturally by women. And, and I don't think that Mexico is the only country that does this. I'm pretty sure that there's, there's many other countries that share this, uh, this characteristic. And by putting and giving them uh, the right information, we can help fuel this uh, already existing trait and, um, and give them more um, knowledge and skills to really take those messages that we discuss here and that are coming up to give them to our children, to our relatives. So it's a great platform that happens in the house. And the great thing about this is that, you know, it's offline, it's face to face, and, and that's what we need to get back into, you know, the good, that good traditional experience. Well, I'm going to have me a sobre mesa today. Around the table, of course, this can be discussed, as I said previously, but I have a little statement. The last question that I would give to everyone to take home and spread it to their friends and family and all their social contacts and everyone is the following. And this should be done after this webinar. The question is, with what mind, what heart, and what soul can the man in our world not realize that the mothers that give birth and nurture the next generation deserve a real partnership of equals in all aspects of life and living? Man, your legacy is the generations to come. And surely we are in the 21st century and we need to realize that this is a partnership not only between men and women, it's a partnership with your children and a partnership with the youth of this world and a partnership with the 30 million species that live on this planet. So real 
equitable partnerships is forward. And it's time to look within ourselves and find that heart and that soul and the mental uh, ability to understand that we have to change and we have to be the change that we want to see the change in others. But yeah, fully agreed. I think, I think it is, it, it is um, important to think about. So a good, a good thought for all of us to go away with and think. But thank you everyone to be with us. I think this is the beginning and uh, we will have this recorded and on our website and we want to connect with all of you and keep you in touch with us all sort of and everyone that's been with us including people who did not speak have all been writing to us and they are really part of a growing network from all over the world and uh, yuri talked about it uh, he became recently a member of the new york explorers club He's been making movies on marine life and on, on uh, the water pollution in South America. And he invited me seven months ago to go with him on a Phoenician ship that he and other people built. And they wanted to go from Tunis to South America. I wish I had gone, but I said I'm too busy. And now he went on this trip. And about four weeks ago, Amazingly, he gave a talk at the New York Explorer Club online and 1,200 people from around the world participated to see the success of this voyage. But not only that, about the pollution in the, in the water, because on this voyage, he always bent over the boat to collect a water sample uh, every so often. So we have mapped out what is the plastic pollution in the oceans starting from Tunis right up to South America. So Can we give a round of applause for Yuri? You can unmute. Thank you. Okay. So to be continued. I'll put that video on the website or YouTube channel so you can, can watch. It's interesting because it's about the ocean. And the ocean, as you know, it's a, a source of life. If you kill the oceans, that's it. We are done. So thank you very, very much for everybody to participate. And let's continue this, uh, this project. I think it's amazing. We have to make this a better world. Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.